You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let's continue to be attentive because I want to share something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. For those of you that don't know, my husband and I, we have a, a worship ministry. We have a ministry collective, a worship collective. We travel around and we host presence nights, they're called. And these nights are very simple. They're a time to come together with the bride of Christ to minister at the feet of Jesus. It's two hours of uninterrupted worship, and it's just about orientating ourselves around the main character. The main character. The main character of all. The main character who was and is and is to come. And in a church in L.A., I think we know a lot about main character energy, right? <laughs> and in churches with platforms all over the world, it's really easy to forget who the main character is when you're on a stage or when we worship with stages. But there is one main character, and what is his name? His name is Jesus. And as I've been uh, just a, a worship pastor for over 20 years, and now we're doing these worship nights, I'm convinced and convicted that there is one thing we will always do first and foremost, and we did it today. Devon led us so beautifully in it. Zeal led us so beautifully in it. But we started off by thanking God. And so today I want to talk about Thanksgiving. And I want to talk about the massive importance and what Thanksgiving does, the miracles it opens, the deliverance it provides. And I want to start off in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 through 9, and start off by talking about that God has a design. God has a way that he does things. And I think a common misconception could be that we would just gather and we would call it blessed and that's how we're going to worship God, and he's just going to put his hand on it. But I want to encourage you that there is a way that's revealed in Scripture. Now, again, this is not by works that we have salvation. Amen? In Ephesians 2.9, it says it's not by works that we can boast. So we cannot get it twisted. This life of salvation, this life of oneness with the Father made by the blood of Jesus revealed by the power of the Holy Spirit over and over and deeper and deeper is because of everything Jesus has done and nothing we could ever do. Yet there is a way. There is a way. Exodus chapter 25, 8 through 9, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. And then he told them how to build the ark. And it's this beautiful picture where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, right? We know this. But then he told them where to hold the Ten Commandments. And he described in very great detail, because God is a detailed God, amen? In very great detail what he should do with those Ten Commandments. And he said, put them in this ark and then cover it. Cover it. Does anybody know what he asked them to cover it with? A mercy seat. Cover it with the mercy seat and put two cherubim on the left and the right, and they will face the mercy seat. And so we know that when the sacrifice was made by the Levitical priesthood that mediated between the people and God, which was started by Moses and Aaron, that this blood, the cherubim were witness, they bore witness to, that the human beings that are imperfect, outlined by the law, right? No one can accomplish those Ten Commandments. Every single one of us falls short of the glory of God, except the mercy seat covers the law. There is a way and there is an order. And so even in Exodus, we see Jesus. Jesus, who we know and learn later, took the mercy seat. Amen? And one thing about the mercy seat that's so interesting that has been occurring to me is that the mercy seat, these cherubim look at each other in the reflection of the blood of Jesus, of the blood of the lamb. And I want to encourage us, that this is not the message, but I think one of the things we can do as the bride of Christ is behold each other through the blood of the mercy seat, of the finished work of Jesus, right? 
that the same mercy that I have required, my brothers and sisters required. And I think this is a key to what it looks like to be the, the spotless bride that Jesus, the bridegroom king, is returning for. Amen. And so the second part of this is in First Chronicles that Jesus has a way of doing things. In First in Chronicles 13, we see David. David wants to bring the ark because he realizes in the days of Saul, they never brought the ark, the presence, the place where God chose to dwell. They never brought the ark into the kingdom. And so David talks to all the elders and they decide it's a good idea. Let's bring the ark. Let's bring the presence of God back. And he gets a guy named Yuza and he gets a guy named uh, oh, Ahio. And Ahio's name means brotherly and Yuza means strength. And they get a cart and they put the ark on it and they start marching it in. And then something terrible happens. The, the cart begins to fall, and Yuza reaches out and touches the ark, and he's stricken dead in this moment. And David is like, what even is going on? And it says, says that he is so upset with the Lord that this happened. But I want to encourage you, there's a, there is something very profound in this, that God has a way. Brotherly strength, the strength in our own right, is not what God is looking after to carry his presence. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, or 1 Chronicles 15 that David took the ark and he put it away for a while. And the place where he left it after this moment of being so frustrated and bewildered and honestly terrified of the Lord, the house where he put the ark just blessed the place and their socks off. They just had cattle and water and uh, multiplied in their riches because the presence of God was with that family. And so he realized, well, there was a way. When God first told them exactly how to create an ark, the Levites were supposed to carry it in. And if we know in the, in the New Testament, the Levites, Levites represent worship. So the Levites took that ark, and they got it up again. They put it on poles and carried it on their shoulders, and they did a great procession. And the ark was brought back into the kingdom and into Jerusalem. And this is that story, if you know it, where David danced before the ark, so excited to have the presence of God back in the center of Jerusalem that he danced his clothes off. God has a way. Then we go to Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. And I remember um, in, in 2009, remember where you were in 2009, in my early leadership days, and I remember reading this passage of Scripture. And it really is a prophetic scripture prophesying Jesus to come. It says, arise and shine for your light has come. Arise and shine for your light has come. And we know that the light that Isaiah is prophesying about, is talking about, is the light of Jesus. There is no other light coming. Jesus is now and forevermore the light. And the chapter goes on to talk about the beauty that comes from us arising and shining for our light has come. And we go into verse 18. And we're going to camp out on this for just a second. It says, Isaiah 60, verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation and destruction within your borders. You shall call your wall salvation and your gates praise. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. So what's really interesting about this is in Revelation, in parts of Psalms, it talks a lot about walls. It talks a lot about gates. And if we think about walls and gates, these are places that provide protection for the people that live in them. Amen? But what's really interesting about the walls being salvation and the gates praise is that the walls, the salvation part, is something that God has done. We receive salvation through King Jesus. But the praise, the gates, are something that we do. So there's a part that we have to play in it. And we see this in Psalm 24. It says, it likens us to gates. It says, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. I don't know about you, but, you know, when I lead worship and when I'm inviting people to come and open up their mouth and praise, I see a bunch of gates, a bunch of doors opening up for the eternal 
the, the beauty of the kingdom of God that you are all attached to when you made Jesus your Lord and Savior, and you literally invite the presence of the Lord into the place that you've been given dominion and authority. And an atmosphere is shifted. That's what it says when we say, Psalm 24, open up you heavenly gates that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. And then it goes on again to say it again in verse 9. Open up you living gates that the king of glory may come in. Now my message is not about the power of your worship. But I want to tell you there is power in your worship. There is power when you're in the midst of a difficult situation and you decide to stand on the word of God and sing the truth of who he is and what he's done in the finished work of the cross. This is what it means when it says that praise is a weapon. It truly is. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? And when we open our mouth, we are agreeing in this realm, in this place, in this heavenly place that we've been given dominion and we say no not on my watch circumstances you have no place against the truth of who my god is and then we talk about gates even more in revelation 21 which i love this because first of all in revelation 21 it's really interesting because it actually talks about the heavenly city and it talks about it and it describes it very specifically it's measured, and it's measured, I think it's 1,500 cubits one way, 1,500 another, 1,500 another, and it describes a perfect cube. And it calls that cube the bride. And it calls that cube the bride of the lamb. Isn't that interesting? Not the bride of the bridegroom, the bride of the lamb. So we can know and we can assess in Revelation 21 that this is about us, <laughs> That this is about the lamb who is also the soon coming bridegroom king and his name is Jesus. And I don't know and I don't understand the whole thing. But I know when God talks about brides, it's about love. It's about passion. It's about romance. This isn't something I use as a metaphor. This is something the Bible uses over and over and over again. That this love that God has for us, this love that Jesus is returning for is a passionate love. And he calls us his bride. So this is a very personal matter to the heart of God. And it says in verse 21, we're going to continue with talking about gates. And I love, um, uh, Pastor Donna today has a beautiful necklace and it, and it has a clam with a pearl. A huge pearl. And we hear about pearls in verse 21. It says, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. And each separate gate was one single pearl. Now, does anybody know how pearls are created? Pearls are created through pressure, through agitation, through irritation. It's like sandpaper. So you, a gate, are also described in Revelation 21 as a pearl. A pearl of praise. A pearl of worship. You know, I've been thinking a lot about something that Pastor Gary preached on a few weeks ago. And it was about um, let the wind blow. And the last time I preached last month, I was talking about it again. It's just one of these things I can't get away from. Let the wind blow. And we know in the word of God it says the, the wind has a will and it blows where it wills. And we learn that the spirit of God in Acts chapter 2 came in as a mighty rushing wind. And we learned in Pastor Gary's message that we can catch the wind. We can cooperate with the wind. And at the end of that message, Pastor Gary and I came up with my husband and just started asking him all these questions. And he mentioned something. He said, you know, there was this thing back in the day that man called breaking the sound barrier. This was a man-made construct. Because now we know that there is no barrier of sound. The broken sound, the, the, the sound barrier has been broken. And it had everything to do with learning how to cooperate with the wind. 
So man and his, you know, beauty that God created him in, the mind of Christ, you know, there's so many gifts that were without repentance. Whether you know God or not, we've been given an intellect to learn how to cooperate. We have a pilot in our congregation. We were talking about this a few weeks ago as well, that there are things you have to do, flaps, airspeed, altitude, and you can learn to cooperate with the wind. And then recently, because I've been thinking about this quite a bit, I learned about something in sailing called tacking. And tacking is literally where you harness the wind to get where you want to go. And I learned that in this metaphor, a sail is likened to the posture of our heart, and the rudder is likened to our tongue. And so when you think about the wind of the spirit, when you think about your circumstances, I was talking to my friend Andrew before, and he was just explaining some really hard things that have been happening. And it would be like a storm kicked up and blowing. And he began to describe to me the posture of his heart, which I immediately thought, oh, he put up the sails of his heart to catch the wind. And why his confession to me right now, he is steering his rudder to tack right in and through it. And he is learning to cooperate with the wind. Now, is the storm still raging? Absolutely. But is he knowing and learning that God is faithful to complete the work he has begun? And that much of this life has nothing to do with what we could do because it's not by works that we could boast. We have the victory because of what Jesus has already done. And so I wonder for you, are you in a circumstance where the wind is blowing or have you ever been? I know for me, as I was preparing for this message, I, I realized, oh, I got to make sure that the posture of my heart is not the sails, you know, the sail of my, of my being, which is my heart, is not flopped over or, you know, pulled down. I don't, I don't know the sail to sailor terms, but pulled down. My sail isn't down or maybe it's down, but it's not. It's just flopping in the wind. And I would say these things are discouragement, not having my eyes on the one from whom my help flows, that maybe I'm frustrated, deceived, uh, in thinking that there is no hope. And then maybe the rudder of my tongue is confessing some things that are partnering with a very lower circumstance than the one that Jesus died to give me. And so instead, what I need to do is lift the sails of my heart. Make sure that, the, that it's not hardened, but that it's supple to catch the wind. That there's forgiveness. That I recognize and I'm, I'm aware of the mercy seat. And I let it fill with the wind. And that the rudder of my tongue is very skilled in when it turns and what it says and when it's quiet. And what I nod to and what I actually look away from. Sometimes agreement can be like that. And I learn to navigate through the wind. You know, there's this, in, in, in my study time, I was reading um, Acts chapter 14. And just after Paul was stoned and they thought he died, he came back and he says this very crazy powerful thing. He says, through great tribulation, you enter the kingdom. And I want to encourage you, if you're dealing with tribulation, heartbreak, the loss of a child, discouragement, can you keep the sails of your heart supple to catch the wind? Can you be careful with the rudder of your tongue and what you're agreeing with? And then finally, If the walls of our salvation and the gates are praise, and we recognize that we need to praise, then I want to talk about something that I heard that I can't get away from, and it's that thanksgiving is the hinge of the door of praise. Thanksgiving is the hinge. 
So it's one thing to acknowledge who God is and understand the vastness of him, but it's entirely another when we begin to thank him. Because thanksgiving encompasses acknowledgement, and it immediately puts us in a heart posture. You know, pastor talks a lot about believing the word of God. This is so important, to believe the word of God. Number two, to die to my will. Not my will, but your will, Lord. And I want to encourage you that thanksgiving, thanksgiving is the hinge that opens up the praise, that makes the motivation of the beholding of the Lord and his vastnesses and and his beauty. When you say, I have to die for my will, for your will, is it even a sacrifice? Because there's a beholding that begins to take place. And I want to further that point by going to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 21, it says, For although they knew God, so you can know God, right? You can see his beauty, his glory, his creation. It's all around us. It says, They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immoral immortal God for images resembling mortal man and the birds and animals and creeping things. And then verse 24 says, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And it goes on and on to talk about Honestly, what sounds a lot like our day and age. And I want to propose to you today that thanksgiving, recognizing the honor and glory of God, and then opening up that door of praise through the hinge of thanksgiving, actually positions us to receive the mind of Christ. Thanksgiving renews our mind to the mind of Christ. Again, I just want to point out, it says in verse 21, they did not honor him or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is a result of not thanking the Lord. This is a result of not honoring who he is. We're left to our own carnal mind. So Thanksgiving renews our mind to the mind of Christ. Number two, Thanksgiving precedes deliverance. Thanksgiving precedes deliverance. And in Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9, we see this. Jonah, who got a very clear message from the Lord and decided he didn't want to do that. Anybody ever done that? (laughs) Or is it just me? Okay. And he found himself in the belly of a whale. I mean, this was a man of God. This was a man God trusted to deliver the good news to the people of Nineveh. And he was tired, and he was sick, and he didn't want to go. He was really over it, to be honest with you. And in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 1 through 8, we see Jonah in the middle of the belly of the whale. And I don't know about you, but if I was in the belly of a whale in the ocean, I would assume we were done. <laughs> I would be like, this is how I die. Here we go, Lord. And I would be astonished and shocked and surprised to still be finding myself breathing and taking in air. And this is what was happening to Jonah in the belly of this whale. And he, I assume, after the traumatic moment of being swallowed by a whale, he settled down a little bit. And it says between verse eight and verse, verse one and verse eight, that Jonah began to remember. And when we were thinking, uh, or when we were singing goodness of God, I saw that moment. He began to remember all of the things God had done, the faithfulness of God through his life. And he began to recall the blessings, recall when God had crashed in, recall his goodness and his mercy. And then in verse 9, he says, But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation begins with the Lord. And with that last moment of thanking the Lord, God moved the hinge of the jaw of this mighty fish, 
and this fish spat out Jonah. Deliverance came from a moment of thanksgiving and remembrance. Number three, thanksgiving preceded a miracle multiplication and a moment of immense lack. Thanksgiving, and I wonder if this is you, so I'm going to say that again. Thanksgiving preceded a miracle multiplication in a moment of immense lack. In John chapter 6, we read Jesus uh, is preaching to the, to the crowd of 5,000, and they become hungry. And the, they bring the fishes and the loaves, and there is not enough for 5,000 people. And it literally says in verse 11, and I looked in many translations, and it says the same thing. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. Jesus, (laughs) Jesus the Messiah, was not shook by 5,000 people. He knew exactly what was about to take place. And he knew exactly what Thanksgiving would do, acknowledging the one who is the one. You know, Jesus only did what he saw his father doing, and he only said what he heard his father saying. And so he gave thanks, and the miracle multiplication took place. So Thanksgiving precedes a miracle multiplication in a moment of immense lack. Thanksgiving. And I imagine if you're going through that, imagine that sailboat analogy again. And the rudder or the sails of your heart is up and the rudder is going and you just head straight into the wind and you thank the Lord and begin to praise him. What that won't do through the middle of your storm. And then finally, number four, thanksgiving is what's happening around the throne from the four living creatures. So in Revelation chapter 4, it just, every sentence mentions the throne, the throne, the throne, the throne, the throne. This is a chapter about the throne room of God. And in verse 11, or verse 8, it says, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. They're full of eyes. That's a really important point. They're full of eyes. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And then it goes on to talk about the 24 elders. When after the four living creatures with all of their eyes are around the throne and they see God and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they thank him. Actually, not, I don't have it here in my notes. so I'm going to look it up and just read the scripture right from there. But it says the 24 elders cast their crowns at the feet of Jesus every time this happens. It's like they can't not see what the four living creatures are beholding. And they can't stay standing up. They immediately just cast their crowns and throw them at the feet of Jesus and begin to worship around the throne. And the four living creatures, individually having six eyes, were full of eyes, or six wings, and full of eyes all over and within. And day and night, they had never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. And whenever the living creatures offer glory and honor and thanksgiving to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall prostrate before him who is sitting on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they throw down their crowns before the throne, crying out, Worthy are you, Lord, our Lord and God, to receive the glory and the honor and dominion. For you created all things. By your will, they were created. And so what I want to do as we close is I want to talk about the beholding. Because the four living creatures had eyes all around and this tells us that they're, they're seeing something. And then it's in complete contrast to Romans chapter 1, where the people all over the earth, all over the earth, 
And the Lord is tearing, and I believe there's more that he's waiting for to enter the kingdom of heaven. The harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. The harvest is ripe and ready. Might it just be that they are not able to behold. They're not beholding in some cases. But what happens with these four living creatures with all of their eyes to see, they behold the glory and the beauty of the Lord. And they declare, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they describe him honor and glory and thanksgiving. And thanksgiving. And we read in Romans chapter 1 that they don't honor him. They don't give him glory. And they don't thank him. And their mind is left to the ways of the flesh. So two things. Number one, I want to encourage you that as you behold the beauty of the Lord in a lovesick, laid down lover kind of way, and that he be the object of our affection at every turn, that we would be those ministers of reconciliation. The ones who have, would have eyes to see the Lord, but also have eyes to see the ones that don't see him. And encourage people, come and look at the honor and the glory due to the Lord. And let's begin to thank him for who he is in the midst of our circumstances. And then finally, number two, this is how we're going to end this. And then Anton's going to come up and he's going to receive um, an offering. We worship the Lord with our finances and, and we're going to end there. But what I want to do is receive an offering to the Lord of thanksgiving. And I want to encourage you. We're just going to take a minute here. Why don't you stand to your feet? And, and I want to encourage you, if you're going through a difficult time, and, and as we've described the sailboat, and you're like, gosh, my heart is so encumbered. I'm, I'm disillusioned. I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm experiencing offense, a bitter root. I keep asking why, and I don't understand. I want to encourage you to begin to navigate with the spirit wind of the Lord, that this is not the end of the story. We know how it ends, that Jesus wears the victor's crown, that he is now and forevermore seated on the throne, and he is moving on our behalf through the storms that we find ourselves and that we can put up the sails of our heart and we can begin to thank the Lord and praise him and head straight into and through the wind that feels like it's pressing against us. And so for some of you, the offering of thanksgiving is going to spit you out in the place of from the place of captivity. And for some... The offering of thanksgiving is going to bring in the renewed mind that Jesus died to give us, the mind of Christ. And for some of us, the offering of thanksgiving is going to allow the miracle multiplication in an immense season of lack. So I just want to do this on the count of three. We're going to take, and I'll time us, we're going to take a good 120 seconds, two minutes, and we're just going to begin to thank the Lord. We're going to begin to thank the Lord for who he is, for what he's done, for how he's moved, for tearing the veil, for waking us up today, for putting breath in our lungs that belong to him anyway, for giving us, if you're walking, legs that move, if you have arms, arms that hold, eyes that see if you are able to see, ears that hear, spiritual eyes and ears that hear. And I believe there's something on the other side of this little hinge of thanksgiving. It is a city, a supernatural city, walled with walls of salvation, gates of praise that we open, hinged by this little tiny, very important thing called Thanksgiving, okay? So on the count of three, we're just beginning to thank him. One, two, three.
That's it, 60 more seconds. We thank you, Lord. Come on, don't waste this opportunity. Just fix your gaze to behold him and thank him for who he is. We thank permission to remind us when the winds are blowing, when the storms seem to be raging. We give you permission to remind us of the power of choosing to look up, of choosing to remember, and to posture ourselves in gratitude and thanksgiving for who you are and all you've done. Jesus, I thank you for the children prodigal sons and daughters. Lord, we give them to you. We lay them at your feet. Jesus, for the healing, we thank you for the healing that we're contending for. That you're moving even right now. That you're touching bodies and disease and casting it out in the name of Jesus. Be healed in Jesus' name. If that's you, be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed In Jesus' name, just put your hand over where you're you're believing for healing and be healed in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you own the cattle on a thousand hills and you own the hills. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God of more than enough, able to supply all of our needs according to your riches and your glory. We trust you, Lord, and we thank you that you are so attentive to us. You don't miss a thing. You don't miss a thing. Your eyes are gazing on us with eyes of passionate fire burning for your beloved. And Jesus, I pray for great transformation in your bride, that we would begin to see ourselves, each other, as the spotless bride that you've made clean by the blood of the lamb, by the blood that you shed, Jesus. This morning I was on a walk and I was talking to the Lord and I got this visual and I saw Jesus And he grabbed his bride, who was the church, and he had her, and he was walking, and the father was standing, looking at Jesus, and he was beaming, beaming at his beautiful, spotless bride that he covered with his own blood. Jesus, help us to see the bride the way you see her, with your finished work. Lord, may we see each other in the reflection of the mercy seat. We love you, Jesus. May it start with me. Forgive us, Lord, when we've been harsh, when we've been judgmental, forgetting that we were in the same need of the same mercy. Thank you. We love you, Lord. Jesus, have your church and your bride. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 
God bless you guys. Thank you so much.